So for today, I'm going to talk about threading hardware in G80. This is a slide that I borrowed from John Nichols at NVIDIA. He, you know, this is one of his hot chip slides, but I thought you know, the slide kind of you know, summarized the, the, the CUDA level programming, CUDA level threading model in a fairly nice way. So basically, CUDA is a single program multiple data uh, threading model. That is, if you look at all the threads that are executing for a kernel, all of them are based on the same piece of program. Okay, they're all executing the same piece of code. So that's single program, multiple data. And CUDA integrates GPU and CPU applications. So, you know, this is back to what we were talking about. You know, well, some of the ex parts of the application is going to be running in serial C code that execute on CPU. And in fact, this might even change. This might even change to, you know, a well, multi-core situation where you can actually have multiple threads running on CPU. So I think this slide needs to change to something like a small number of threads. But each kernel will correspond to exactly one thread on the, on the CPU, so you will have, need to have multiple kernels that correspond to multiple threads on the CPU eventually. Um, with a little luck, we may actually be able to let you guys do some of that this semester because we have multi-core CPUs and you know, all, uh, all being set up. So you know, at the end of the semester, you may be able to have some fun with it. Okay. And we also have a uh, 32 GPU cluster being set up. So that will be another thing that you know well, could become fun you know, at the end of the semester when you do these projects. So parallel kernel C code execute on GPU thread blocks. So a typical scenario is you execute CPU serial code for a while and then you do a kernel call with these number of blocks and number of threads, boom, right? And you incur all these threads in the, uh, in the grid. So the grid is organized into blocks, right? And each block has multiple threads, up to 512 thread, threads in, in each block. So, so far, so good. And then, then you do some more CPU in serial code, and then you do another block, which you did not experience in matrix multiplication because matrix multiplication only had one kernel. But in a bigger application, you can imagine that you will have you know, multiple of these data parallel phases and then you would just keep doing this kind of stuff. Especially when you do like a, a time um, simulation of you know, a large system, biological system or a physical system or chemical system, you will have these time steps and each time phase will likely be a kernel and you will do some bookkeeping and some stuff and then you go back and do another big kernel and da da da. So that's sort of the basic you know, mindset of the threading model. And then we translated that into a little bit of a more abstract thread organization in the CUDA. And this is a slide that we showed before. So it's just a, um, you know, a, a review of what the sort of the grid and block organization looks like. So we're, show, we're still showing the serial code, kernel code, kernel one, kernel two, like progressing time. And then, so kernel one would, would generate grid one, which is a, you know, a, it could be up to two dimension of blocks. So you know, in matrix multiplication, that's exactly what it was, two dimension blocks, right? And then each block could be a, could, is actually a 2D or 3D or 1D, um, you know, organization of threads. So it's up to you. You can decide that organization. And all the threads in the same block can cooperate. And this is going to be important tomorrow. That is, all these threads can actually synchronize with each other and they can actually share, have very fast shared memory access, okay, with, uh, within the, the block. And then, you know, uh, two threads from different blocks, okay, will not be able to share data. And we're going to come back to this point tomorrow. But this is just a quick review of you know, the, uh, the CUDA thread model. So if you look at each thread block 
in detail, whether that's 2D or you know, 1D or 2D or 3D, uh, you know, you you would not, you would essentially be able to say, well, this is just a you know collection of threads, and they all execute that same piece of code, that thread program. Okay, and um, <coughs> it's important to remember that you can only have up to 512 of these threads in each block. Okay. That's one of the limitations you, you need to keep in mind. So, as I mentioned, in the future GPU implementations, the scaling of the machine is going to be done in such a way that you will unlikely have more threads per block, but they will likely allow more blocks in the machine. Okay, that's you know that will be the easy scaling. However, it's not always the case that you can get away with it. Because if the application requires you to have more efficient sharing, then you'll be pushed to have bigger blocks, right? So you know there's some you know push and pull kind of thing. So all threads in a block execute the same thread program. Threads have thread ID numbers within the block, and so you know you would you would know exactly what your ID is. It could be a 1D ID, it could be 2D, it could be 3D. Depends on what you decide to do. And threads share data and synchronize what doing its share of the work, and the thread program uses thread to select work, thread ID to select work, and address memory. So that's how they can you know, process different pieces of the, uh, you know, the, the data. So that transitions into what we're going to be talking about. What we have talked about so far has been the abstract programming view of these threads. Okay. And that's how intuitively the program could a programming model, you know, says about how your your program is going to in invoke those threads. And these threads ultimately will have to be executed on the hardware. And this is where a lot of the tricky points about parallel programming will start to occur. Because you know, no matter how good we are, we are still engineers. And we're going to have limited resources. We're going to have limited number of wires. We're going to have limited chip area. We're going to have limited amount of power that we can consume. So by the time we need to deliver a product, there will be corners cut. No questions asked. Okay, there will be corners cut. It's a matter of which corners were cut and what kind of effect they will be. So, you know, we're going to talk about some limitations in this piece of hardware. This is a very powerful piece of hardware, but it also has some major, you know, some important limitations that you need to understand in order to really, you know, deal with performance uh, effectively on this machine. So, overall, from a very top point of view, the whole chip is typically called a streaming processor array. Okay, so if you look at GAD, there, um, the whole chip is called the streaming processor array, and it's essentially tiled. Okay, you look at the chip, it's actually tiled into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these, what, it, what we call the texture processor cluster. So each of these clusters, if, if you look at it carefully, it's actually two what we call the streaming multiprocessors, and then one texture um, processing unit. Okay, they both share that text processing unit. And each of these SNs, SN is perhaps arguably the most important hardware unit in this machine. The organization of the SN really dictates a lot of the efficiency and a lot of the limitations of this machine. So each SN can be blown up into a you know piece of a, a, a piece of design that is not so unfamiliar to many of you who are familiar with computer architecture. We'll have instruction cache, we have a data cache, and we have. But by the way, this data cache is actually the constant and you know a constant cache kind of thing. So you know we'll, we'll come back to that. And then you have the instruction fetch and dispatch logic. 
And this is actually a non-trivial piece of logic. And that also dictates some of the limitations we're going to show today. And you have a piece of shared memory. And we're not really going to talk about shared memory today, but, but we'll, we'll save it for tomorrow. And on, underneath that, we have eight of these streaming processors, SPs. And each of them is a fairly simple piece of processor. It actually has just one arithmetic unit that can do multiply and addition and it's, uh, simultaneously. So it's a multiply add unit. And there are eight of those. Okay? So, so these things are going to, you know, we're going to go into more details of this particular design, not for the sake of teaching how you can design GPUs, but for the sake of just enough for you to build a very strong intuition about how this machine actually works as you program it. So this slide is just a very quick summary of the terminologies. SPA, TPC, SAM, SP. No, streaming processor array, texture processor, uh, processor clusters, streaming multiprocessor, and streaming processor. And this is not no rocket science. Okay, these are just definitions and then acronyms. But just give you a very quick one page summary of all these terms so that in the future if you get ever get confused, you can just go back and look it up. That's all there is. So let's go into the streaming multiprocessor and talk about some of the most important uh, issues. So this is a picture where you know some of the details get you know get filled in from the uh, from that first picture of that uh, uh, SN. So there are a couple of things. <coughs> One is you know what uh, as we said. <coughs> It's really organized into two you know, symmetrical uh, 4SP, 1SFU. This is a uh, super function unit thing that we're going to talk about later. So if you look at the, the layout of the machine, each processor, each streaming processor, has a sort of a closely associated register file you know, a bank, and there's a fairly comprehensive, essentially a all points to all points interconnect, okay, between, you know, between these things. So that data in one register file can be routed very quickly to another streaming processor. So as far as we are concerned, the interconnect of the register file so elaborate that it almost doesn't matter which register you access, you should be able to get that data you know, at, in the same amount of time. And there's some discipline usage of the registers that you, you will need to, to, to make in order to actually get this to totally work you know, in a transparent way, but the compiler takes care of that. So you, 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 you don't need to worry about it. The compiler actually allocate registers and so on in such a way that this network works very, very well. Okay? And they do a good job on that. So as a programmer, you don't need to worry about it. But if you ever want to be one of my students, grad students working on the compiler technology for these things, you probably want to need, need to eventually understand a little bit more about you know, some of these design trade-offs. Multi-threaded instruction dispatch is something that we're going to actually spend a little bit more time today. So we're, get, we're going to have between 1 and 512 threads active on this piece okay, of hardware. It will have, you know, well, actually it's not even 100, uh, 512, it's actually 768. Let's make that correction here. It's 1 through seven, uh, 768 threads active. Share the instruction fetch per you know what um, you know per one per thirty two threads. That is, every time you fetch an instruction from the L one cache, that instruction is going to be used by thirty two threads. Okay, it's going to be used thirty two times before the next one gets used. Okay, and that's. 
going to be interesting when we do some timing calculation later. And it covers the latency of texture and memory load, and we're going to also talk about that. The only reason why I talk about hot clock here is because ultimately you can use that to estimate the, the, the calculation rate of your program at some point. But it's not really important. The new products are already 1.5 gigahertz, and you know they're going to get to 2 gigahertz at some point very soon, you know, in the near future. And local register files are these, but there are sufficient number of these, you know, wires that you can actually, you know, access fair, uh, fair amount of uh, non-local registers. 16k bytes shear memory and DRAM texture and memory access. So event, if you want to build DRAM uh, texture memory and constant memory access, theoretically you need to go all the way out. But there are caches on, on the, uh, you know, on, in the hardware that you normally would not have to. So let's begin to talk about how these threads get created, assigned, and scheduled on this machine. Okay. So this is a slide that uh, David used, in, you know, in, in, and I also used that in one of the lectures. So this is the GPU, the graphics personality of the chip. And remember, when the DirectX or OpenGL API functions execute, they will make requests to this chip in terms of, you know, vertex drawing or you know, a, a triangle drawing and you know, texture shading and all that stuff. Each task will have, you know, either a list of vertices or triangles to process or you know a, a, a bunch of you know uh, pixels on the screen to work with right so those things get essentially you know into these hardware interfaces so that you can have vertex thread issue you have geometry thread issue you have pixel thread issue and those pixels will be loaded into some of these you know uh, memories and the, uh, the vertex vertices will be loaded into some of the memories but more importantly, you know, if you're uh, issuing, you know, vertex threads, these threads are going to be sequentially just, you know, vertices just sequentially be issued into one of these SNs, and those the threads that correspond to those vertices will also be, you know, generated and activated on each SN. So the hardware internally generate however many number of threads necessary to actually implement that, that uh, API function functionality internally, and then you will just schedule these things internally. The piece of hardware that CUDA uses is really the thread execution manager that responds strictly to the kernel invocation, okay? As soon as the CPU executes a kernel invocation, this piece of hardware, the driver running on the CPU will immediately invoke this, drive, this piece of hardware. And this piece of hardware will take a look at all the, dimen the dimensional uh, dimension parameters and begin to generate threads, okay? So that, is where you know all the threads of the grid uh, of the current grid is generated based on all the uh, kernel call parameters. So here is the life cycle of the thread. Whenever you launch a grid, you know you will that piece of hardware starts to generate all the blocks of threads for the grid. Okay, the hardware does it. Okay. Finite state machine. And the thread blocks are serially distributed to all the SNs. So you, each block will take probably something like one clock cycle, okay, to go into one of the SNs. So essentially, if you generate, let's say, 50,000 blocks, okay, and, but each SN can only take a small number of them at the same time. Right? So 
most likely what's going to happen, and I'm not saying that's exactly what the chip does, because NVIDIA has not told me how the chip does it. It's actually, you know, if I knew, you know, I wouldn't tell you either. <laughs> so, since I don't know, I can tell you pro what probably happened, right? So this is a fundamental reason why we don't sign NDAs, because, you know what, if they don't tell us, we can guess, and usually we guess pretty well, right? But if, if, I, if they told me, then I cannot tell you anything, right? <laughs> Even if I said I guess, they say you you didn't guess. You listen to us. So, the, um, what hap what probably happens is that, that that piece of logic in the previous slide would generate would just make one request to each SAM, okay, in one clock cycle. The first block goes to the first you know was SAM. The second block goes to the second SAM. The next cycle, the third block, and so on, until so it will go like this until it fills up all the SMs. At some point, the SMs will be full, right? They cannot take any more blocks. However, at that point, chances are you still have a lot more blocks in the grid that you have not done yet. Does that make sense? So, at that point, the logic will stop, okay? Will, will pause. And they will wait until the SMs crank out all these threads, you know, as quickly as they can, right? And but there's a, you know, there, life is never fair. So some of the SEMs may ex execute these blocks faster than these others because, you know, it just happens that you got to the memory bandwidth a little bit better or, you know, some random things. So, you know, some of the SEMs will finish before the others. So at that point, the piece of logic will say, oh, SM3 came back and say, I finished one of the blocks. So I will just assign another block into SM3. Right? And that, it will keep going like this to, to do what? Load balancing. Because you will want to make sure that all the SAMs finish roughly at the same time. So that you can get the least possible execution time. If you don't do this, if you just go ahead and give each SAM one sixteenth of the threats, when these unfortunate events or fortunate events happen during the execution, let's say one of the SMs ended up finishing a lot later than the others, then you will end up with the execution time dragged on, everyone waiting for that thing because you cannot go back to the CPU until everything is done. So load balancing is very, very important and this the sequential assignment allows them to do load balancing, you know, well very in a very simple way, okay. So that you know that that's just my speculation, right? Any other, any questions? Okay. So this is what we call the block assignment or thread assignment to the SAMs. Assigning them into the SAMs doesn't mean that you determine how they actually execute. It just means that the SAM owns the particular block at this point, and it will be responsible for executing all the threads in that block. Something we know for sure, if this, the block is not assigned to any SM yet, then none of the threads will execute, right? That we know for sure. But if you assign a block to an SM, that doesn't mean that it will be executed anytime soon. It depends on the scheduling algorithm actually used in the SAM. Okay, so we'll, we'll, talk, we'll go into that. So this is the assignment. And then each SAM will launch all the warps of the threads. And this is a concept that is not part of CUDA. This is purely an implementation convenience. Okay, so as soon as a SAM receives a block, it breaks it down into 32 thread chunks called warps. And in fact, all these warps are of continuous ID. Okay. 0 through 50, uh, 31, first warp. 32 through 63, second warp. They're always consecutive, for, just for simplicity. Okay. And so these warps are actually the scheduling unit. That is, every time you execute anything, you take the whole warp on. And then if you need to put it off, you take the whole warp out. Okay, you do this kind of swapping. 
So all the things that got tossed around during execution and schedule at runtime are done in warp units. So so far I talked about two granularities. Okay, I, 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 I gave you two granularities. One is when you assign threads to the SNs, the granularity is blocks. Exactly. And whenever you schedule threads in the SAM, the granularity is works. Good. So SAM schedules and executes works that are ready to run, and I'm going to sh actually show you the mechanism how, you know, how it is done. And then as works and thread blocks complete, resources are free. So every time you complete a warp, it may not be sufficient because there may be other warps on the block that are still executing. So there has to be a hardware that keeps track of the status of every warp in each block, right? There has to be a flag set for each warp you know, that finish execution. And as soon as you see all the flag set for that warp, for the, uh, for the block, then you can retire that block. You can go back to the, to the control unit and say, I can have another block now, right? So that thing, is actually not unlimited. You need to keep track of the status of all the warps in each block, right, in order to do this bookkeeping. So that's the reason why, in this generation, only eight blocks can be assigned. A maximum of eight blocks can ever be assigned to each SAM, because they only provided eight of those flags, okay? And those eight flags will allow you to keep track of the status of all the warps in all these blocks that you can do the bookkeeping right. It doesn't mean that they cannot afford to, to, to track more than eight blocks. It's just that, you know, from an engineering point of view, as you will see, other resources are probably limiting the number of blocks to less than eight anyway. So providing eight blocks means that that particular factor is probably not going to be a limiting factor. But in some cases, and I'll do some calculations at the very end, you may have a situation where the number of blocks could become an issue. Okay? But whenever you're in that situation, you're probably not in very good shape. Okay? How, how does the SM execute these things? Essentially, we will have, you know, these blocks. Okay, that get assigned to each SM. So I'm showing multiple blocks assigned to this SM. I'm good. I'm also showing multiple blocks assigned to the SM on the right. Okay, so you know you you will, you will have multiple um, blocks assigned to the SM. In the current generation, I can say with almost certainty that the number of blocks and that gets assigned to every SM will essentially be the same, unless the total number of blocks is not a, a multiple of 16. Okay. So, you know, except for very boundary conditions, you know, in time and so on, in a steady state, all the SMs will have the same number of blocks assigned to them. And that's exactly what you want, because you want to have a load balance system. Okay. Threads are assigned to SM in a block granularity, as I've mentioned before, and up to eight blocks to each SM as resource allows. Keep in mind, there are other resource limitations that can lower the number. And SM in G80 can take up to 768 threads. So if each block has more than 128 threads, you will not be able to get to the A block limit. Right? Because 768 divided by 8 is 128. If you have any more than 128 threads per block, then you will not be able to reach the A block limit. You'll be hitting the 768 thread limit, total thread limit. Why is this? This has to do with scheduling logic. 768 correspond to 24 warps. Okay. 
If you divide 768 by 32, you get 24. The instruction, remember, we're scheduling these warps. So the scheduler has enough hardware to keep track of how many warps? 24 warps. Okay. So why 24? Someone probably did a, did a study and found out that for the memory latency, for the amount of hardware resources you have, if you have, you know, somewhere around, you know, 20 or somewhere around 19 warps or something or 12 or whatever, you will be able to make pretty good utilization of the machine. So they add some margin to it. Oh, 24, you know, fine, right? As always, engineering, you know, decisions. So it could be 256 threads per block and it could take up to three blocks, right? Or it could be 128 threads per block and you could take up to um, six blocks, right? So, you know what? It, you'll not be able to, you know, get more than, you know, as, um, eight blocks if you have, you know, more than 100 threads. And threads actually run concurrently. Essentially what happens is that all the warps and all the all the warps of all the warp, all the blocks get thrown into a big pool. And every point in time you reach into the pool, you yank out one that is available ready for execution. Okay? So SM manages to schedule these threads, you know what? And so I already told you a couple of things. One is the SM will organize and keep track of the status of all the blocks and they will also track all the warps so that you will know when each warp is available for execution. How is the scheduling done? The scheduling is actually done with, um, you know, in the warp um, granularity. So, again, I want to emphasize this whole warp thing is an implementation decision. It really is not a, a, a part of the CUDA concept. Why do I keep telling you this? Because the warp size can actually vary from generation to generation. I'm not telling you it well, but I'm telling you it might. And that might is a very bold faced might. Okay? So, when you write a piece of code, knowing the existence of warp will help you to optimize performance, but when you optimize performance, you also need to think a little bit about the fact that these warp sizes could change, and what would be the effect if these things change in the future. And if you optimize it so much that you, when the warp size change in the future, your performance is going to go down the drain, you may not want to do that optimization, okay? So warps are scheduling units in SN. So let's say if three blocks are assigned to an SN, okay? So let's just take the matrix multiplication example, you know, 16 by 16, so you have, you know, 256 threads per block, and you can have up to three blocks in each SN. So how many warps are there in the SN? Well, each block is divided into 256 divided by 32. So you have each block will have eight warps. And there are three blocks, so therefore you have 24 warps. And so basically you saturate them with uh, the SM. That's the maximum number of warps you can get. At any point in time, only one of the 24 warps will be selected for instruction fetch and execution. Only one of them will be. Okay. So you have 24 of these things, and they are all kind of you know in different states. But in every point in time, the purpose of the scheduling logic is to find one. As long as it can find one, it doesn't care which one. Okay, just because you can do something useful in that clock period. So how how does the schedule the um, the the scheduling or execution timing look like? 
So basically, this is a you know a courtesy of John Nichols from Nvidia. In fact, I, I stole this picture from his uh, hot chips uh, you know uh, presentation. And you know basically, he's showing that you know in the upper picture there's these threads, right? And then you have all these warps, you know, under under the uh, under the thread. And warping means that you you cause some distortion or you cause some kind of temporary raising or lowering of of a surface. So if you have a space warp, you know, it looks like this, 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 right? So that's, you know, essentially what warping means in the, uh, in the old days. So if you look at the, um, the time, what happens is this piece of hardware can execute a different instruction, an instruction from a different warp in every time step without losing efficiency. So it's the same thing, the same performance or same efficiency. If you execute the instruction one, two, three, four, in four time steps from the same from the same warp from the same warp, right? Or it could be instruction one from warp one, instruction two one from warp two, instruction one from warp three, instruction one from warp four. These two give you exactly the same performance results. So the hardware does not lose any clock cycle, anything, by either executing four consecutive instructions of the same warp, or just jump around and execute one instruction from you know four different warps. Make sense? So that's why it's called zero overhead warp scheduling. Warps whose next instruction has its operands ready for consumption are eligible for execution. So the hardware keeps track of all the 24 warps, but some of the warps may not be occupied. So you know, not if you have less than 24 warps in the machine, the hardware will just disable those additional logic, right? So you will keep track of all the warps that are active in the um, in the SN, and you will look at the operand availability. Why would an operand not be available? Is it Typical situation is if the execution of the instruction takes a long time. Let's say a load instruction can take a long time. So the hardware will execute that load instruction. But the hardware will also take a note that the destination register of the load instruction is not available for use. Right? That load, you know, so load is going to write into a destination register. And so the hardware would just say, you know, it's not available for, for use at this point. 200 plus cycles later, when the value comes back, the hardware would go and set, reset that bit or set that bit in a way to say, oh, now the value is ready, okay, available. <coughs> What's going to happen is that if the warp has a instruction later on that came along later, that needs to use that load destination register. It's going to try to, you know, it's going to, to the hardware will keep track of that particular instruction and all the source registers for that instruction. If any of those has that little flag saying that it's not available, that instruction is not eligible. That puts the warp out of the eligibility pool. Any of the source registers for that instruction is not available, keeps the warp out of the eligibility mode. Okay? Make sense? So you can actually do the following in this machine. You can actually keep doing all the loads. Okay, you can do keep doing multiple loads. And each one will go out to the main memory. Okay, each one will incur a long latency. As long as you don't use any of those load results, okay, until later, the warp will just keep executing, okay, until it hits the point where it actually uses one of those load results. So this is the reason, part of the reason why the compiler scheduling of within the single thread can actually be very useful, and we'll do some calculation later to show you, you know, why these things are actually, you know, fairly useful. And that has to do with the number of threads or number of um, you know number of warps that you have. 
simultaneously. That magnifies the compiler effect of these things. Thanks. Now, all the threads in a warp execute the same instruction when it is selected. So this says, if I ever want to execute a instruction in the warp, I'm not only checking the availability of that operand for a threat. I need to check the availability of that operand for all the 32 threats. So that piece of logic actually has a lot of bits. Okay? You'll have 32 threads, and each instruction will take up to four input operands. So you will have 128 of those bits just to keep track of the operand status of a single instruction. Okay? And you can't just keep track of that for the single instruction. Keep in mind, you may fetch the next instruction and you know uh, you, you need to keep a lot of these bits around just so that you can you know correctly track all these things. So that's the reason why you know these you cannot have too many warps in, in this machine. It turns out it takes four clock cycles to dispatch the same instruction for all the threads in a warp. Would anyone like to take a guess why the number four? Because eight SPs, you have to do it four times. Exactly. Remember, we have 32 threads in the warp, and we only have eight SPs. We only have eight real processors. So. NVIDIA has never told me this, so you know what, I, I, I'm not telling you anything I really know. So chances are what happens is that the hardware will just take the same instruction and iterate four times. Four clock cycles. Each clock cycle, eight of the threads go into the SPs. The next clock cycle, eight more go down the pipe, and so on. So it takes four clock cycles just to get them through the pipeline. So each instruction actually will keep the instruction dispatch unit busy for about four clock cycles. Okay? And that's a very important concept. So I'm applying that concept to do the following instruction uh, you know, uh, for calculation. Let's say you're writing a piece of code. Okay? In this piece of code, you would do one global memory access, one global memory access in every four instructions. You just look at the code. You have, you know, multiply, add, you know, something else, and then you do a, you know, you also have a global memory load. Okay, so if you look at the code, and I'll show you how you can look at the code, right? It's, it's called PTX, and, you know, eventually you will be looking at it. So I say, okay, during execution, I'm going to have four instructions for every memory, global memory load. <coughs> what that means is that if I only had one warp, okay, if I had only one warp, then I would, on average, execute 16 clock cycles for those four instructions, right? One, four clocks for each one. The four instructions will take up 16 cycles. Okay? And then you have this long latency, right? What's going to happen? There will be 200 minus 16 cycles where you cannot do anything until the load comes back and then you do the next one. Assuming that one of the four load instructions use that load result, which is probably the case. Okay? So in order to make the pipeline fully utilized, I will need to have 13 warps minimal in order to tolerate the memory latency in this particular situation. Because I need to have 13 of those 16 cycles in order to form a 208 fully occupied cycles. And then every 16 cycles worth of one of the mem global memory accesses will hopefully come back. So you will have a very nice staged execution. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. So that's how, if you write a piece of code, that's how you can intuitively imagine, okay, how you might be able to, you know, fill 
the machine. Granted, the, there will be random effects, so it will never be as clean as what I just said. So you will need to have more warps in order to write out of these latencies. So that's why it's not 13. You know, they, that's why they provide the 24. Okay, this is one of those margins that I was talking about. Right? Someone did some calculation and say, ah, okay. So you know, if I did 24 for a lot, most of the code mixtures that I see, I probably will be able to tolerate the latency for you know for all, all these code. It's an engineering decision. So this picture shows that if you stand, if someone is small enough to stand by the SP, okay, and just look at the SP, time goes this way. You know, you so if time progresses later and later and later. You will you can conceivably see. Oh, instruction 11 of warp A, you know, is dispatched for four clock cycles. And then instruction 42 of warp 1 gets dispatched for four clock cycles. And then you see, warp, you know, instruction 95 for warp 3 gets dispatched for four cycles. And da 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 and then you say, oh, you, then you go, go back to instruction warp 8, instruction 12. Why do you need to have so many? Because this is probably a memory latency here, right? And you needed to have all these other things in between in order to tolerate this memory latency. And you're going to have a mixture of all these things, you know, like during execution. It doesn't have to be switching all the time. If the warp is still ready to go, it's totally conceivable that the scheduler just will just let it go, let it continue to go anyway. You may not need to break it up. Uh, break it up and uh, you know, uh, use other uh, warps anyway. But I don't know. Okay, so this whole magic happens in the SAM instruction buffer. Okay, this is a piece of hardware that does the magic. What happens is you have the instruction cache in the back. Okay, so the instruction in the back actually has, you know, let's say, you know, it needs to feed the um, you know the the 24 warps. So each warp will be at a particular instruction point, right? And they may those 24 will be all at different points of execution. However, remember this is a SPMB code, so the I cache doesn't have to be very big because. All the warps are executing this, you know, well, pretty much all the blocks are executing the same piece of code. So as long as they're not too out of sync, chances are they're all executing at different parts of that same code. So that's why instruction caches can be very small. Okay? So now, you know, if you fetch one warp instruction per cycle, you know, from the L, from the L1 cache. So the L1 cache can be small, it can be fast. And every clock cycle, you could be just you know fetching instructions out of that that cache. And every four cycles, you're going to be you know releasing one instruction from one of the warps, right? And then you will go back and pull that instruction into the buffer. So the reason why you want to have you know one cycle access is that at the beginning of the execution, for example, you want to be able to quickly fill that buffer. So instead of having four cycles per access, which is balanced, sometimes you can fill the buffer much, much more quickly, and then you turn it off, right? You, know, you don't need it. So that gives you a very quick buildup of the, of the buffers. All the 24 instructions for the 24 different warps can be you know, all pulled out of the uh, instruction cache very quickly. And then you issue one ready-to-go warp instruction per uh, you know, not exactly cycle, you know, probably more like four cycles. <coughs> and what happens <coughs> is that you know you will you will just you know keep getting these things into the you know like get in, into the um, the SP, and then the issue selection based on the the selection is a little bit of an issue because you may have multiple of those warps. If you're lucky, you may have multiple of those warps that are ready for execution. Yes? What is RF? Oh, register file, sorry. 
Oh, this is uh, it's oh, not radio frequency. Yeah, it's very just a part. But you know what? I, I'll go over this later. So right now, just focus on this, you know, instruction buffer for now. Okay. So there will be 24 of those instructions all sitting in this buffer, and you will have all those bits keeping track of the op availability of the operands. In every clock cycle, hopefully you'll have one or more forms that you, you, you can execute. So the scheduling logic would use H or run Robin to pick one of the ready warps for execution. Why do you use H? Because you want to get these blocks through as quickly as you can. You don't want to have a situation where Everyone's executed a little bit, but not a whole lot, not not a whole other than you know what have retired. Because remember, it, it will be sequentially assigned to the um, you know the, the new blocks are sequentially assigned to the SEMs. So you want to be able to retire each block as quickly as possible. So if the block has been there for a while, you want to kind of push them out. If a grad student has been in the grad school for more than 10 years, we do everything we can to help the student to graduate. And when I was in grad school, there was, you know, there's, you know, there were there were a, a particular, you know, title for some grad students, tenure grad students. So if you are not careful about scheduling, you could have a tenure block that just keep missing the dispatch, okay? And you know, it just never makes progress, right? And eventually occupy a resource in a necessary way. So you want to, you know, make sure that you do that, you know, as quickly as you can. And so SM broadcasts the instruction to 32 threads, you know, of a warp. So essentially it, it will take, you know, you will take the instruction and go through it four times each time essentially it goes to eight of those right what's wrong robin wrong robin means that you know well, uh, if they're all of the same age then you just you know just be fair you 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 actually go to each you know each warp a different warp at a time so that they take turns okay so that that's called wrong robin it's just a kind of a fancy name for being fair so all the registers so this is, you know, called scoreboarding, and this was actually invented by Tom, uh, by Thorn, uh, Thornton in CDC 6600, and this is a, a machine designed in the 1960s, and he actually designed this machine with what he called a scoreboard, and meaning that whenever you go to a sports event, scoreboard is where everyone will be checking, right? Especially if you're on a team, you want to make sure that nobody goes and, and switch the number around <laughs> without you know, your consent, right? So it's a very important piece of logic that keeps track of the winning and losing <laughs> of teams. And in this case, the winning and losing of scheduling okay, for these threats. So all the register operands of all the instructions in the instruction buffer are school boarded. So they, you know, you'll have up to four of these input operands. Every input operand will be tracked in terms of their availability. The status becomes ready after the needed values are, uh, you know, are deposited. As soon as the memory load instruction deposits the value, the bit gets cleared or set. Depends on your design. And this prevents hazards. And the instructions with all the operands cleared are now eligible for issue. So this essentially decouples memory and the processor pipelines. And this was one of the, you know, uh, um, sort of uh, concepts that uh, someone called Jim Smith kind of pioneered. Was a PhD from here. With, uh, he's a professor in uh, Wisconsin, and many many years ago. He, you know, he really, you know, taught a lot of people about, you know, how decoupling of memory and processor can work. That is, instead of 
doing, you know, memory access, and then stop the processor from doing anything else, you just go and set a bit saying that the upper end, the output of this memory access is not available, and then you go do something else, right? And as soon as the upper end comes back, then the instruction waiting for that thing wakes up, and now you can proceed. But in the middle, you don't need to just hold up the entire processor waiting for that memory access. That's what we call, we call de decoupling. And any thread can continue to issue instructions until scoreboarding prevents the issue. So in this timing diagram, I'm showing time going from left to right, and I'm showing, you know, for example, for, you know, so the, each color shows a, a thread, a, a thread block, and then, you know, I show a, a, a combination of thread block and the, uh, the, um, the, the warp. So for thread block one, I can have warp one, and I can also have warp two, and so on. And thread block two, I can have warp one, warp two, but I only showed one of them. But uh, thread block three here, I showed warp one and warp two. So I, I'm just trying to show you that you know you can have multiple warps in a thread block. You have multiple thread blocks all scheduling at the same time. So conceivably, you could end up in a situation where you have several issue all done on consecutive instructions, okay, in that thread block and warp. And then at some point, you reach a point, the, the instruction seven is actually waiting for, you know, let's say a long latency uh, operation. So you switch to thread block two, warp one, and then you do some instructions one and two, and then up, ah, and run out of things to do. I go to thread block three, warp one, and up, ah, I run out of things to do, and all these things are still waiting, so I, I go to thread block three, warp two, and if it, so maybe I would, you know, this could be a long latency floating point rather than a memory access. So long latency floating point, instead of being 200 cycles, it could be 16 cycles. So that means that you can actually just execute, you know, something like four, okay, four warps in the middle, right? Four warp instructions in the middle that gives you 16 instructions. So by the time, the, you know, the, um, the, the end of the 16 cycles, now you can execute instruction three. So this machine actually has quite a few different latencies that you need to tolerate. There's some longer latency floating point instructions. There are also situations where you may want to use texture memory. And that texture memory actually takes a few cycles to execute. And you can also go to, you know, long latency memory. All these things require some amount of tolerance. By using the bits and resetting the bits whenever the result gets deposited, Whenever you have a shorter latency instruction, you will deposit the result earlier. If you have a longer latency instruction, you will deposit the result later. So as soon as these results come back, the instructions waiting for that result will be eligible for execution. So you can just adjust the waiting time of these instructions according to their latency. Right. So this is a fairly simple but quite elegant and quite effective way of dealing with these varieties of latency. Okay, in a machine. So you can, you know, so this is the kind of picture I kind of want you to keep in mind, okay, in your brain when you when, when you think about the execution of these threads and so on. You need to think about, you know, the execution switching around in terms of the, of the unit of these warps. Whenever you execute these threads, there's one important rule to remember. If your block size is not a multiple of warps, warp size, that is, it's not a multiple of 32, let's say you came up with a very clever way of blocking something, and you ended up with something like 96. That's 32. Um, okay, 92, okay? <laughs> I don't know how you got to 92, but let's say you, you, you got to something like, uh, you know what, uh, actually 72 plus 16, 80, uh, 88, okay? Let's say you, you got an 88 tile, and you ended up with 88 threads, but it's not a multiple of 32. What happens is that the hardware will automatically truncate 
So you will actually round it up. So you will end up with three warps. And what that means is that you're constantly wasting the execution resources for those threat positions that you're not using in the, in the warp. And in some piling algorithms, this can be actually a significant factor. Because if you ended up with not too many warps in a block, and you ended up wasting the end of one of the warps, it can add up to a very significant percentage. Remember, these are all big numbers. So whenever you have these big numbers around, you can actually end up you know, wasting some very significant um, amount. So before I let you go, I want to just go through this exercise and make sure that you have the right intuition. Okay? So that's it for matrix multiplication. Should I use 8 by 8, 16 by 16, or 32 by 32 tiles? Okay, so you know, how do I make that decision? So I can start with, you know, well, let's say A by 8. If I use A by 8, I have 64 threads, right? There's one, one per tile point, right? So I have A by 8, I have 64 threads per block. Now, since each SM can take up to 768 threads, this 64 threads per block means that I need to have 12 blocks in order to saturate my machine, my SN. Would I be able to do it? Because I can take, I, each can only take up to 8, right, 8 blocks. So I hit one of the limitations. Okay? If I go with six, uh, 32 by 6, uh, 32, then I ended up with 1,024 threads in my block. Go home and try it on, on, the, on the machine and see what happens. Okay? It should fail to launch. Because even taking one block means that you will exceed the capacity of 768 threads. So there's no way to accommodate any block in this configuration. So it should fail to launch. Okay? Now, for 16 by 16, we have 256 threads per block. Since each SM can take up to 768 threads, it can take up to three blocks. It's seven, it was, you know, divided by, uh, divide 768 by 256, you get three. And that gives you full utilization of the machine. Whereas if you look at 8 by 8, you will end up wasting one-third of your machine. So just from purely from blocking factor point of view, if you pick 8 by 8, 16 by 16, suddenly you can see, easily see one-third performance degradation between the two choices. Okay. And this actually is something that you will be seeing in some of these application developments. You will be seeing jumps of performance or jump, you know, or drops of performance in fairly significant ways. And if you think about it, this is essentially quantization. Okay. For those of you who who, are, you know, who study signal processing and so on, this is exactly quantization effects. Whenever you have to go with, you know, granularity chunks, whenever you just miss a little bit you ended up go to the next lower bracket, right? And this is essentially what it is. You have these quantified, you know, quantized, you know, 64 quantities, and whenever you exceed that, you immediately get four of your blocks out of the picture, even though you may have enough hardware elsewhere to do it, but it only can take eight blocks, right? So one of the limitations can easily take off one third of your application of performance. Okay, so this is the beginning of building that intuition, and I want you to you know to, to keep doing this in the next five lectures. What I want you to eventually realize is that in general, this is actually a multivariable optimization problem. Okay, and it's something that in the most general case, you will not be able to reason by looking at one variable at a time. But we'll get to that later. Okay.